who's a research scholar at, at Edinburgh University and an activist at Student Federation of India, SFI. Thank you, comrade, for giving your precious time for this talk. And I think we can start. Comrade. Uh, hi. Uh, so I think we can begin. Um, I have a small presentation so that uh, we're not just stuck looking at each other during the course of today's discussion. So I'll just go ahead and try sharing that as well. Is this visible to everyone? Yes, comrade. Yes, sir. Yes, comrade. OK. Uh, before we begin, um, I, I would just like to know if if or how many of us here have um, perhaps gone through the manifesto. Uh, everyone? No one? Some of us? Only they're typing in the chat box. Some of them have. Okay, so uh, it looks like a mixed bag. Um, I myself, uh, I, I was a little uh, underprepared for uh, today's discussion myself because uh, the last time I read the manifesto was quite some time ago. So I had to read through it again myself. Um, so going back to the presentation that I have, um, the structure that I'm hoping to follow today in today's, in today's discussion um, would be, a, I, I would uh, just probably go over um, the themes that Marx and Engels have presented in the manifesto for probably the first 20 or 30 minutes. And then, uh, you know, in the interest of not having a monologue, perhaps we could have a discussion towards the end on what we've individually uh, picked out from the manifesto itself. Um, so going over to the first slide, I'll, I would like to essentially go over the historical setting in which the manifesto was written, a, a sort of an introduction over what the manifesto really talks about. So uh, in, in my reading of the manifesto, I think that it is essentially an examination of the nature and spirit of uh, capitalism, of the capitalist society. So what that essentially means is that Marx and Engels have tried to present a scientific anal analysis of capitalism, of capitalist society, and how it essentially differs from you know, uh, earlier forms of social organization. It could be, for example, feudalism. And um, why the manifesto is singularly unique uh, you know, people say that apart from the Bible, there is perhaps no other book, no other written document that has been translated nearly as much, has been uh, republished nearly as many times as the manifesto. And the reason this is so is that at its very core, the manifesto is um, simultaneously both quote unquote critical and uh, emancipatory. So what that means is that in analyzing capitalism, in analyzing capitalist society. Uh, the manifesto's analysis is so indistinguishable, inseparable from its call for a revolutionary overthrow uh, of capitalism. So uh, its analysis of the contradictions within capitalist society, the various crises that capitalism gives birth to, uh, its analysis is so indistinguishable from its revolutionary commitment to a society that is characterized by uh, what one might call mutual solidarity by what uh, one might call equity. So uh, this is the single most distinguishing future, in my eyes at least, um, of the Communist Manifesto. And that is why, you know, in, in its relatively short history, it's been around for just a little over 170 years. The Manifesto has uh, come to be characterized as the living, breathing, programmatic ideal of the communist movement. So these are all, these are all in quotes. Um, be it through 
countless persecutions faced by communist revolutionary be it through wars that have been waged over the decades the communist manifesto essentially has served as the compass for a struggle against all sorts of oppression so this is essentially what i feel is the overarching uh, a, a sort of a birds eye view of what the manifesto is about and coming to the uh, contextual setting in which the manifesto came to be drafted it, it, the setting is provided by something that is known as the epoch of the dual revolution so this essentially begins from um the late 1700s you have the french revolution of 1789 um that along with the industrial revolution that breaks out in great britain spreads to europe to america so all of this is happening at the same time and what this essentially means uh for the working class is you know although there is this combination of political and industrial revolution that has come to enhance the political power of a certain section of people it has come to enhance the economic standing of a certain section of people it it also at the same time um puts the vast majority of society the working class into um immense penury it immiserizes society and despite there being this revolution in in the social relations during this period of history we see that the working class at the peasantry really gains little to nothing um so this is what provides the context for the setting uh, for the drafting of the manifesto because there is immense this is uh, dissatisfaction we see uh, the stirring of revolutionary attitudes uh, across europe we see a wave of unrest and all of this happens we see a wave of unrest in 1848 uh, uh, as well so uh, this it is during this context that the communist league really commissions the drafting of the program of the of the communist party so this i think is the, it, it's it's uh, it's a very general introduction to what the uh, communist manifesto is about and uh, what i'm hoping it provides a, a brief uh, historical setting for the drafting of the manifesto as well uh so this slide is where i would like to spend uh, most of the time uh, of what i have in today's discussion the, this is this is the structure of the manifesto so there's this four broad overarching structures uh, that uh, marx and engels have uh, framed uh, the manifesto along and uh, apart from the preamble uh, you have the first section the bourgeois and the proletarian and this essentially be- begins with the uh, with a quote that i'm sure most of us are quite familiar with that history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggle and um, here marx and engels go on to talk about how society as a whole is splitting into these two great hostile camps these two uh, great classes that 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 are fighting against each other and he call and, and they call um, them the bourgeois and the proletariat so uh, what w- what does that mean so these are not terms that one usually comes across on an everyday basis so what do you essentially mean when you say bourgeois what do you mean when you say the proletariat so so in marxist uh, terms in, in the marxist conception of class one's class position is defined in terms of one's ownership over the means of production that means the ownership of capital and um in a class society in a society that we live in which is uh, characterized by class antagonism between say the uh, the bourgeois and the proletariat between the capitalist class and the working class um in in such a society we see that the bourgeois class exercises control over capital and this capital and the control that they exercise over this capital is used in turn to oppress to op- appropriate the labor of those who own nothing but their ability to labor so this is how one comes to define uh, the capitalist class and uh, the laboring class so it is defined in terms of uh, 
does one own capital or not um, so th- again these are very uh, general ways of putting it there is a lot of nuance one once uh, one goes into uh, marxist literature and different schools of thought regarding the same but i i think in the interest of brevity uh, for today's discussion at least this uh, should suffice um so uh, this is what um marx and engels have come to define the working class and the laboring class as and uh, they also go on to note how you know in a class society capital property has a class characteristic so um the very basis of marxist thought is founded on the fact that you know although uh, production is a social reality it happens as the result of collective action of the working class the result of this production the result of this labor it has come to be appropriated by a certain class of people by a certain by a specific set of people and that is the bourgeois class and these the bourgeois class really uses their ownership over capital to um, appropriate more capital and that can only happen by increasingly oppressing the working class so that is why we say that in a class society capital has a class characteristic that means that although it is a product of uh, collective action like i already mentioned of unified action of the working class its ownership is in the hands of a very few number of people so um i think nothing uh, illustrates this better than these two graphs so this is taken from uh, a working paper by uh, lucas chancel and thomas piketty from a few years ago and it really indicates the share of national income uh, on the left hand side you'll see the that the top 1% of the country the 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 capitalist class uh, they own a share of above 20% of the uh, of the national income as of 2015 whereas the bottom 50% of india's country owns less than 15% so this really speaks about you know the extent of inequality that uh, society has come to be characterized by and this is not just um, in india you take a look at data for for example oecd countries you will see that inequality has been increasing um, ever since there has been this revolution um, in industry um so uh, how is it that uh, these bu- that the bourgeois and the proletarian class really comes into existence you know how is it that a certain class of people have come to get ownership over capital and how is it that a certain class of people have nothing but their ability to work nothing but their labor power uh, to sell how has this reality uh, uh, come into being and the very simple answer to that is through violence and when one speaks about violence it is not just you know the physical manifestation of violence although that is a very real um Uh, uh, uh it has played a very real part in in the long term dynamics of capitalism it still plays a very important role in the long term uh, dynamic in, in capitalism as of today um for example when we talk about the foundation of of uh, the industrial revolution the textile industry in britain it was founded on breaking you know the backs of handloom workers in india uh so all of this uh is a very real aspect of capitalism and this is what marx really develops in full detail in his um, in, in the work that is most famous for in capital in volume 1 of capital he goes on to talk about this concept called uh, primitive accumulation and the quote that i'm using from capital is capital comes dripping from head to toe from every pore with blood and dirt so uh, while it is not just you know violence in uh, the physical term we see that for example in india on an everyday basis uh, tribals in this country are uprooted from their homes to ensure that uh, forest lands can be appropriate for appropriated for things like mining 
there is an increase in militarization of the police not just in india but across the world just uh, just today for example um the dobi ghat slum in delhi was demolished so that the lands can be appropriated uh used for something else despite a high court stay order and things like that these are the everyday realities that um most of us are aware of but this violence also refers to a very systemic violence it refers to the everyday uh, lived reality of oppression that is facing the the billions of uh, uh, working class across the world so and this cannot happen without you know the active intervention of the state in favor of um, the capitalist class and um for example we see this uh, whole turmoil against um, these farm bills that were introduced by the union government and what that essentially tries to do is uh, it tries to expose uh, petty producers petty producers sorry in the country to the vagaries of the market in the name of quote and quote free trade so that you know these this section of producers it can shrink and their place can be taken over uh, by industry for and this is also uh, when we talk about primitive accumulation it also um, can happen through for example privatization um, uh, be it through the privatization of schools be it through the privatization of healthcare so when all of this happens it really um, impinges on the income of the working class it 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 impinges on how much petty uh, on how much the petty producers in this country can grow and uh, that space is again obviously taken over by uh, uh the capitalist class so uh, uh this i think refers to the first section of the structure and that uh, really flows into um the relationship between the working class and the uh, communist so i've already spoken a bit about the class character of capital how the class character of capital is oppressive and it is oppressive because uh, its existence the existence of uh, of bourgeois property implies the lack of property for everyone else so while some people can have ownership over property that really implies the lack of property for the working class on the back of whose labor this property has come into the ownership of a certain section of people so in one small phrase if we if we could define um, uh, it we can say that the origin of bourgeois property of capitalist property is founded on the basis of class exploitation of class antagonism of the exploitation of the many by the few and um, the theory of com- uh, communism at least in um, the manifesto what uh, marx and engels comes to say is that they they try to sum up theory of communism in a single sentence and they say that the theory of communism in a single sentence can be summed up as saying the abolition of private property and uh, we must really think about what that means about what what, what does marx marx and engels mean uh when they say the abolition of private property it really means that the conversion of uh private property into common property so all we, we just merely changing the social character of uh private property uh from one that is that was earlier within the control of a certain few into a um, a situation into a, a a situation where it no longer is oppressive in its nature where it no, can no longer be used to exploit uh, wage labor and uh, why i refer to this portion is because this is where the role i think um, of communists come into play because how does one really uh, seek to abolish um, private property um uh, and this is uh, also something uh, a line that is often heard everywhere is by converting class in itself quote and quote into class for itself when the working class of the world rises up and seizes political power and this is where the role of uh, communist 
uh, of the communists come into play and this is where uh, if we talk about the immediate immediate task of a communist is essentially to convert the working class of the world of the country into the ruling class and it is only through the gaining of political power that we can change you know that we can abolish private property that we can change these bourgeois property relations that productive forces for example technology can actually be used in the service of the common good and not just in the service of a select few section of people and uh, that is where marx and engels i think situates the the historical role of the working class because um, and this is a very um, salient point that there is in the manifesto that it is only through the emancipation of the working class that humanity can uh, really emancipate itself it is only through uh, the emancipation of the working class that the free development of one and this is again a direct quote from the manifesto the free development of one can come to mean the free development for all and um, this was again popularized massively by this 1915 um, pamphlet by rosa luxemburg in which she says uh, it is either socialism or barbarism and more recently in light of climate change we also have come to hear the slogan eco socialism or barbarism um uh, this is this is a quote again i think uh, which really speaks to how um, the manifesto has uh inspired countless revolutionaries in surrectory action in surrectory action across the world um this is a quote by uh, the by fred hampton who is an activist of the black panther party and he goes on to say that we're not going to fight capitalism with black capitalism but we're going to fight it with socialism we're not going to fight uh racism with any other form of racism but with international solidarity and uh this is uh really where the role of uh, communist revolutionaries comes into play it is only when you raise the consciousness of the working class to a level wherein they can seize political power themselves um and that is the immediate task i think uh, of a communist party um and essentially the last uh point in in the structure of the manifesto in which we speak about the role uh, or the position of communist in relation to various other um, opposition parties marx and engels tell us that as a communist it is the duty of every communist party to play uh, to take part in revolutionary movements against the existing scheme of things so what that essentially means is that it is your duty as a communist to convert every crisis that there is in society into a crisis for capitalism and while this uh, while this might imply that you have to join hands with certain um, uh, opposition parties it also means that the communist shouldn't lose sight of the of the larger frame of things of the larger goal that they are working towards that is uh, to raise the consciousness of the working class so that they can uh achieve political power so i think that is sort of all i had to um uh speak about in terms of what i uh what i think are the overarching uh teachings that the manifesto has uh for us today uh if if the organizers wish to conduct a, a discussion or a question answer session um I, i think we can do that as well hello yeah if anybody have any question you can ask or you can write in the chat box
uh, anybody or if anyone has any points that they think that i've missed out on this i see a lot of comrades here who i know for uh, sure have read the manifesto so if anyone wants to point out um, any things that they think i should have mentioned or you know any personal uh, readings from the manifesto it could be in terms of an example that they would like to point out um, they can do that as well uh if there's nothing to ask i think we can end the session here yeah and if there is uh, nothing else to be added i think um, it would really help if everyone um does go back and read the manifesto it's a relatively uh, short book and i find it uh, personally find it extremely inspiring um it, it has informed a lot of um, the work that i try to do i mean I, Uh, Comrade, we have a question. I think uh, Pulkit is asking, "Don't you think that communism can be very bad in its practical aspect aspects? Like, uh, how would you govern such a society?" Uh, does anyone want to initiate the discussion around Pulkit's question? Okay. Um. So, when you say uh, bad aspects of communism, um, I'm not really sure what you mean, because that in, in today's um, uh, day and age, uh, these are really terms that are uh, framed within a very uh, bourgeois understanding of things. So, when we say good governance, bad governance. these are essentially we are we are working within a very liberal uh, theoretical framework so what do you mean by um, good governance what is the governance records of capitalist societies um for example india in today's juncture it was never a socialist society but especially since the 90s with um, liberalism coming to play a, a massive role in the country we see that today we have uh so uh, pulkit i'll just get back to your point what i what i was talking about is that you know for example in today's situation in india um right uh we have a situation where we have 1.3 billion people but of those 1.3 billion people near about 500 million are existing in a situation of everyday hunger so they are malnourished by in in every sense of the word and this is happening in a situation wherein the food grain stocks in our country are at their highest you have um uh multiples in in, in the tens so uh, all our food grain stocks are massively above uh their buffer limits but you have a situation wherein food grains are just being left to rot uh instead of being you know used to uh fill the stomachs of the millions of the hungry working poor of the country 
and this is not just in india look at the governance records of say um, the west um you have inequality increasing on an everyday basis you have uh, massive amounts of crime beat in the west and we we just seen what kind of intervention uh, the west has played in afghanistan and the kind of um, impact that has had on the global um, on the global order so when we speak about um, governance records and we speak about good governance it we really need to introspect on um, on whether you, you know our usage of these terms are being framed within uh, uh, within an understanding that is um, capitalist in its nature so but if we look at say for example the governance records of uh, socialist countries be it the soviet union uh, we have china these are all still not you know communist societies in the sense of the word they still uh, very much so in a transition uh, phase but even so you see that no other society has played um, has been able to lift in such a short span of time so many people out of poverty beat developments of technology beat uh, you know emancipation of women for example in uh, the, the record of the soviet union with respect to the participation of women in public life is not a record that can be countered um, um, in in any sense of the word so when we say really about participation about real democracy uh, one really must question whether the democracy that is that one is faced with within a liberal framing of the uh, of the word within capitalist societies is you know a democracy in its true sense polkita i hope that answers your question Uh, anybody else if have any question you can ask yeah when when we speak about violence again um we are again working within a very liberal understanding of the term when when the violence of hunger is not violence the violence of poverty that is inflicted upon uh, upon the laboring class that is not violence but when the working start working class stands up and you know really uh, tries to seize political power for itself so that uh, there can be a better future for their children for for humanity as a whole that will always be framed uh, as violence so essentially uh what the oppressor always tries to do and this is not something that uh, and, and that should surprise any of us is that the daily systematic violence that they inflict uh upon upon the oppressed is never seen as violence it is seen as the natural order of things be it for example um uh, the covid pandemic the covid pandemic is such a political situation that was brought about precisely because we live um uh, in a society where in the modes of where in the relations of production are framed um uh, by the ideology of capitalism so uh countless number of people we know have suffered and so many people have died and all of that has been brought about uh by a health by a healthcare system whose legs were cut off uh from underneath it precisely because you know you uh, the powers that be saw it fit to privatize to make it more expensive to make it more inaccessible so all of that uh polkit i think is, is is violence and when the working class really stands up and tries to uh, reclaim the world for itself because it does it does have a a, a world to win as uh, engels and marx say in the manifesto that i i don't think is violence and if one really sees that as violence i think it is because um, our minds are so colonized by the ideology of the bourgeois that we can't help but see it any other way
Uh, yeah, I think Pulkit answers. Pulkit question has been answered. So, if I, anybody else have any question, you can ask, or else we can end the discussion here. So, if anyone has any other question or discussion, we can proceed, or else we can end the session. But uh, if someone hasn't read the manifesto yet, uh, we can maybe have another session after a few while when everyone has read it and discuss it. So, if anyone wants to say something or have any question, they can say it, or else we can end. Uh, okay, if in, uh, anybody don't have any question. So, uh, yeah, one thing I forgot to mention is that uh, this session was organized with the collaboration of Bread and Roses, the Reading Circle of LSA and uh, Faroza, the Reading Circle of DCAC. So you can all follow up uh, their respective pages on Instagram. And thank you, comrade, for giving your time uh, for this beautiful and enlightening session. And thank you, audience, for joining in. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Congress.